the, the reason a lot of people believe there's none is because of this last verse that is tacked on to the eight. But is biblical scholars since the time of the earliest church, even before we had a canon of scripture, biblical scholars have always believed that that last one, that last verse right there, was specifically for the apostles. Specifically for them addressing specific circumstances in the church, the persecution that they were going to suffer. So he reiterates that message of persecution for them. So just for reference, if you wanted to go to Luke's gospel, there's something that's called the Sermon on the Plain, where you find four Beatitudes of blessings with the four woes. Y'all familiar with that? The four blessings and the four woes. Traditionally, when we speak about the Beatitudes, we're speaking about these in the gospel of Matthew. The, the one thing that you notice immediately about the way they are constructed is that there, there's three parts, very clearly three parts to each one of them. Uh, and I think the structure is an important thing to consider uh, on, on its own. You no doubt notice the rhythm. There is a consistent and intentional way that Jesus speaks them. The opening word is blessed. Blessed. The Greek word in, in Matthew is actually a Greek word called it's makarios which means the, the, the most literal translation of that word is happy. Makarios, happy. Followed by the situation in which those who are blessed find themselves poor in spirit, mourning, thirsting for justice, etc. And then finally, the third part of it is the reason for which they are blessed. Or how they will be rewarded for I guess one way to think of it is a reward. How are you going to be rewarded in this blessing? So it's happy to be in this situation to receive this particular gift. They're all constructed that way. I will give you a, a, a hint uh, up front about a thing that I'll be talking about probably Thursday when we look at the last one. There are only two of these, and it's the first one and the last one, who end, which end identically. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is the first one and it is the last one. So what I want you to try to do, or challenge you to think about it this way over these coming nights, is to think of them in harmony, to think of this as a complete sentence. Don't think of them as like taking them and trying to separate them. Because I guarantee you, if you try to live one of them and not live the others, guess what? You can't do it. It is a harmonious, continuous teaching that God incarnate himself is sitting on that sweet slope overlooking the Sea of Galilee. It's God incarnate himself speaking these words. So there is a harmony and a rhythm to it. There's a unity to them. And yes, the first and the last one both end with that. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that's what this is really about, is the kingdom of heaven. So, why do we say a Christian identity card? As the Pope says, is we, if we live these, we reach joy. This brings joy. And joy is the mark of the Christian life. People will know you if you are joyful, right? They'll want to know what you're up to. I'm suspicious about that, right? You will know the Christians by... Right. So, so it is a Christian identity card, all about the kingdom. So many books have been written about this particular topic. I mean, if you were to go and try to do an internet search right now and find the top 100 books written on the Beatitudes, you're going to get a million hits because they are in, they're infused into, into every single uh, sort of, if you think about academic disciplines, even on philosophy. I know that I teach in the secular classroom. In a university, when I teach philosophy, we look at the Beatitudes, in, obviously in a very different way, but these, these little nuggets of wisdom are universal. And so they've been looked at from a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different people, a lot of different religious and non-religious traditions. But the biggest thing I want us to take away is their practical application in our lives as Christians. The Christian identity card. How do you show that to the world? How do you check all of those things um, for the world? So this scene, 
Jesus beginning to teach them, as Matthew says, was much loved and meditated upon by the earliest Christians. This portion of the Gospel of Matthew was widely in circulation by the end of the first century. It turns up in homilies as early as the middle of the second century, those that have survived that we have. So we know that the fathers were exploring them in a particular kind of way. Uh, I am going to be drawing very heavily upon um, a few people for interpretation. And it's not anyone who's lived in the last 1,600 years. <laughs> okay? So it's not going to be a pop culture guru. It's not going to be, uh, this is not Oprah or Dr. Phil and the Beatitudes. This is not Joel Osteen and the Beatitudes. This is, looking at the Beatitudes, the earliest commentaries from people like St. Jerome, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose, who all wrote commentaries, their own personal commentaries, on the Gospel of Matthew. And guess which portion of that Gospel gets the most attention from those writers? Matthew 5. They have a lot to say about them. So the scene, actually, um, that you're looking at here, um, so, so the depiction of the Sermon on the Mount is found a very early art. I mean, you go back, you can look at early medieval art and find it um, through the high middle ages and into the Renaissance. It finds beautiful expression as well. But this is actually a favorite of mine. This is an 1896 work by a Polish artist named Carol Ferenczi, who, um, and I love it because it shows Jesus speaking to people dressed in contemporary clothing. This could be any of us. And you notice anything else about this particular painting that's a little unusual? It's 19th century. Remember, this is radical. So what's a little bit interesting about this one? He has his back to us. He has his back to us. Which makes it interesting for, for other reasons, but, but it's a timeless teaching. These are timeless words, and that's kind of what the artist was trying to get across here. Maybe think about the lives of the saints who lived these Beatitudes, and we're going to be looking at that a little bit, aligning some of these Beatitudes with specific saints. Um, or just to, to think of some examples, you can probably think of some on your own, too. What might not seem so Catholic, which we'll do a little bit, is to talk of, touch upon at least, popular culture and the Beatitudes in movies. So many movies, so much of our popular culture, depict the Beatitudes, and a lot of people don't even stop to consider this. Right? Consider Forrest Gump. Blessed are the pure in heart. Right? Doesn't that kind of come to mind when you think about Forrest Gump? Blessed are the merciful. Gosh, whenever I hear that, I always think about dead man walking and Sister Frajal. Right? To kill a mockingbird. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or for justice. Man for all seasons. Right? And come on, most of you are old enough to remember that. Some of you maybe not, but most of you are old enough to remember man for all seasons. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness in that one as well. Anybody ever seen the film Amazing Grace, which is about um, William Wilberforce and the drive to eliminate the slave trade, to ban it? The British Parliament finally banned the slave trade because of his efforts. And I always think about uh, that as well, this, this hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So the context we want to talk about is when you think about Jesus going up on this gentle slope and after he was seated and the disciples gathered around him, please always remember when you hear these words, and I've already said it twice, but please remember, this is God himself speaking these words, sitting on that mountain. So not just, again, not just on the hillside to those who are there, but to all of us. Promises to all of us in every age. These are universal. They don't change. They're not contingent on the society you live in, the age you live in. Uh, they are universal. 
So even the early fathers and doctors of the church, I've mentioned a few of them, call this, I'm using some of their own words, call this teaching, quote, difficult. Okay? St. Jerome, who was a difficult person, happened anyway. Difficult, shocking. St. Augustine calls them radical. Okay? But when you think about what the word radical would have meant to St. Augustine, we think of it as being like out there, right? Radical actually means to the root. To the root. So when St. Augustine calls them radical, what he means is this is it, people. This is getting to the very beginning of what it means to be a Christian. So after you get through, um, let's sort of look at the, the context for this, okay? Um, everybody see that? No, you can't see that, can you? And you went about all Galilee. Y'all didn't bring your Bibles to a Bible study? <laughs> Shocking. Okay. Oh, well, these are Catholics, too. Okay. Oh, she didn't bring your Bible. All right, good. Okay. And he went about all Galilee. This is the context. There's, a, there's bookends to this, okay? He went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Okay? So that's in context. That's what's happening. That's what's going on when Jesus assembles this, before this, this crowd. He climbs up on this hill. He lets his disciples approach him, and then he begins to teach. So what is the other bookend? Let's look at what's on the other side of these. Okay? You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand it gives light to all in the house. Let your light go, shine before men, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. These are the bookends of the Beatitudes. So this is what he's done. Now he's going to tell them how to do this, how to go be the light of the world, the Christian identity part. So think about why this would have been important for the apostles to hear, especially. It's important for all of us, no doubt. I'm speaking to all of us. But especially at this point in time for the apostles to hear this. In a world where suffering makes no sense yet, does it? It doesn't make sense yet. So these are just the introductory words, right, to this broad sermon of the mount. Um, it's the imagery that Jesus gives us of two houses. Remember, one built on rock, one built on sand. Um, what it really means to live the gospel, what it really means to be a Christian. All right, y'all ready? Here we go. Because this is nothing less than a visitation from the Holy Spirit. When you hear these words, because they are the words of God himself. It's a divine encounter, a divine consolation, um, a divine message, a reminder that we can accomplish nothing on our own without the guidance of these. So, let's look at these. Oops, that's for tomorrow. <laughs> Let's go back and talk about this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, remember that, okay, so the rhythm is blessed, happy, are the people who find themselves in this situation. And what is their reward? Blessed, happy, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right? So if someone is happy because they are poor in spirit, what does poor in spirit mean? What does that mean? 
Are we really talking about a physical kind of poverty? Are we talking about going out and selling everything that you have so that you can stand before the Lord and say, I am poor in spirit? And y'all, I have heard it taught this way. You switch through those channels late at night when you're suffering from insomnia, and you can come across some heretical things. Okay? Amen, right? I've heard it taught this way, that this is some kind of a, a physical poverty. In other words, send me your money, you can be poor, and you can enjoy the blessing of this beatitude. This first one is so foundational, because remember I told you we have to think about these as a harmony. They're all connected. So you have to start with the first. This is the first step, the first, right, the first step out of the gate. The poor in the spirit. St. Augustine is very clear that the poverty here is not poverty materially, but it is, let's substitute another word, it is humility. Okay? Humility. Now, would you ever think about that, maybe just reading that line, casually reading it, poor in spirit? Is that the word that necessarily come to mind? Humility. St. Jerome agrees with him and says this is foundational to the rest of these because humility is the foundation. If you can understand that, everything else naturally follows. You can do nothing without humility. Nothing. Because it leads directly into the next one, by the way. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning what? Have you ever thought about this one as being... Mourning, actually, a, 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 again, a physical or emotional kind of longing or grieving for something or someone. I've heard it explained that way, too. Happy are those people who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Okay, that's a very surface read of that. Let's go a little deeper. Okay, we're going to go a little bit deeper. If you are humble, in other words, once you have been able to set aside the biggest stumbling block we have to submitting ourselves to something greater than ourselves is a force called pride, right? If you can set that aside and humble yourself to the fact that you are not it, then you will mourn. This is a natural thing that follows. What are you mourning? Your own sin. Your own sin. Have you ever thought about, has anybody ever thought about these this way? Because this is not original, okay? This is not a Cheryl White original. I mentioned to you that I drew very heavily upon the fathers of the church. Somehow, through the centuries, we have lost the intense, deep meaning of this. That it is a direct encounter with the living God, standing in the presence of the living God, if you humble yourself, you are going to mourn your sin. That is inevitable. It's inevitable. If you're humble, you're going to confront your own sin. You're sorrowful, right? So that's the first and principal type of mourning um, that we're talking about here, is mourning your own sin. So this one concludes how? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How is that kind of mourning, the mourning for our sin, seeing ourselves for what we really are, broken, sinful, how does that comfort come to us? I'm looking at a room full of Catholics. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all all need to go to the confessional, clearly. Maybe, maybe you haven't been inside one for a while. I don't know. But this is how we receive that comfort, that consolation, is the church. This is why we feel so good when we leave the confessional. It's this. We have to be contrite, sorrowful, mourning what we have done what we have omitted, what we have failed to do, 
to even approach the grace of that sacrament. And we are comforted in return. There's a direct connection to the sacramental life of the church. Remember the scene in the Gospels where the sinful woman threw herself at the feet of Jesus, washed his feet with her tears, right? Dried them with her hair. And the consolation that immediately followed when he said, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Think about St. Peter's denial of Jesus. Think about that scene. The sorrow that he must have felt afterwards and how he was consoled. So, blessed is Peter who mourned and he was comforted. And how did Jesus comfort him? What reward did he get besides the consolation of forgiveness? He got to lead the whole church. Right? He got to lead the whole church. Even if our hearts condemn us, and this is, um, you may recognize, even if our hearts condemn us, St. John says this in, our, in his first epistle, even if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. And that's what this is talking about. To be able to weep or mourn over your own sin is a special grace itself. Now, Let's connect these, because how is that even possible? If you are living the first beatitude in a posture of humility, then you will mourn your sin. You cannot separate these things. You cannot. Remember when I said at the beginning, try to live one of these and not live all of them? There's a harmony, there's a connectedness, there is an absolute blame here. But there is a second dimension to this second beatitude as well. It's to be able to mourn with others. To be able to mourn with others. Weep with those who weep, St. Paul says. To be touched by the suffering of another in a way that leads us out of ourself touches back to what? The first beatitude. To be, to be moved to, to help someone who is suffering draws us back to that humility. So these are all so intimately connected. Um, it is in consoling others that we are consoled, as St. Francis of Assisi said. How many times have you noticed that when you are helping someone else, being present for someone else, you forget your own circumstance, or it lifts your spirits for sure. I want to talk about a very specific word. Empatheia is the Greek word. Empathy. Empathy is how we would say it. It's, it's a word in Greek that literally means in feeling. In feeling. How does that differ from sympathy? Okay, so, so can you sympathize with someone but not necessarily have empathy for them? Yeah. You can, you can look at a situation that someone is in and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I'm going to sympathize with that. But, you know, move on, right? Empathy in, in feeling comes from, the, the, the root of that is pathos. Pathos. Suffering. And it's not the same word as sympathy. It's not the same word. This is actually meaning to feel what another person feels. To feel it too. To take the pain of someone else upon yourself. It's a remarkable grace to be able to do that. And the only way we can approach that, again, is by living the Beatitudes. To be consolers requires us to do this in a loop. We have to do this in a loop. Always being in a posture of humility. Always, always, always. Humble yourself, the promises follow in abundance. This is the Christian identity part. They will know us by our humility, how we treat others. Right? How is it that we treat others? So, <clears throat> what you're going to see, I hope, how are we doing? How are we doing on time? Ooh, look at me go. Wow. <laughs> I was worried, actually, about not having enough time, so... Um, so good, we can, we can have a conversation if you'd like to. Um, I'm going to say this more quickly than I thought I would. So, if you look at these, again, and they're printed in your book, 
course. They, there is a specific order to them, okay? Um, and I've also seen this done. Um, I've seen these taken out of their context, right? Well, we're only going to focus on the attitude number two. Or we're only going to talk about the attitude number four. And what I really, really want you to see um, over these next few nights, and don't worry, anytime we have left over tonight, I am totally taking tomorrow night. Okay? Because tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about righteousness. Well, I should be talking about the word meek, and then we're going to talk about righteousness and justice and what that even means. But um, it'll be a little bit more intense than tonight, perhaps. But this is foundational to understanding the very first thing that we are recognized for on our little Christian identity card is our humility. Is our humility. So tomorrow night, as I said, we'll be talking about um, the meek and the righteous, or is it justice? Um, remember that the earliest church understood these to all be connected to each other. The order is harmonious. I mentioned that. You can't take these out of order. The blessing, remember the Greek word is makarios, which means happy. Who This person is happy who is in a particular circumstance. They form a completion for the first and the last. The first and the last is the kingdom of heaven. And within the kingdom of heaven are all of these other things. Okay? All of these other things. All right. So since we have so much time left over, I was going to say, okay, guys, give me an hour. And I have used 32 minutes. Um, does anybody have any thoughts? Anything that immediately came to mind about these two videos? And probably what I need to do is maybe stop the video. Since, um, yeah, maybe I should stop the video. Because sometimes I'm really bad about remembering to repeat the question. And then somebody's watching the video and is confused. And it's all my fault. So, thoughts, comments reactions.